Hello and welcome to Byju's IAS. Last week we had discussed about meaning of ethics and conscience as a tool of ethics. In today's lecture, let's learn about emotional intelligence. What are emotions? When we are happy, we laugh. We are in a state of ecstasy. We are in bliss and there is extreme happiness and euphoria. And this is when you feel like floating in cloud nine. When we are sad, we cry. we sob we are in a state of shock and turmoil tears just gets welled up in our eyes and this is when we need shoulders that can lend support to us so basically an emotion is a state of mind which is either excited or in disturbance and balancing these two entities and controlling the agitations of the mind is what is called as emotional intelligence so it is not about triumph of the heart over the brain but instead it is a unique intersection or assimilation of both heart as well as the mind so it is not a fight between the intelligence quotient as well as the emotional quotient but getting both these together in order to solve an emotional problem emotional intelligence is said to have three important skills what are those one is the emotional awareness this is nothing but an ability to identify and name one's own emotion so let's say you are in happiness you identify that you are in a state of happiness and let's say you are sad you are able to identify that you are in grief so identifying whether you are in a good state of mind or not and then in case you are too happy you don't over promise people and in case if you are too sad you don't take up hasty decisions so identifying what state your state of mind is is what is called as emotional awareness so you are identifying yourself you are reflecting on your thought process and you are able to bifurcate whether you are in a state of happiness or in a state of grief so the first step is about identification and reflection of the thought process so this identification and reflection of your own thought process is what is called as emotional awareness this is followed by problem solving and using one's energy to intend a particular objective in a right direction let me explain the second skill under the emotional intelligence with the help of an example let's say there are about four people who are living happily in a forest area these are tribal families and they are contained with their life they are in a state of bliss and they are a happy family but then one single day there is this corrupt government officer who comes up confiscates their land and in that particular situation three of the family members suffer a major heart attack seeing this the other person the fourth person in the family has two options one is to fight this particular case legally in a court of law or he can fight this officer the corrupt officer in an illegal way how does he fight it in a legal way so the legal way includes fighting it in the court of law using all the basic legal amenities that are present taking the case to the court with the help of the lawyer getting in touch with the ngo or using other set of people in and around him to ensure that there is legal justice served to this particular person at the same time there can also be an illegal provision as well how because he is living in that area forest area he might get influenced by the naxalite people so he may also take up arms as well he may go against the government officials because he is a government officials he may go against the government as well he can go against the state as well and what this also means is he has taken an illegal stance here so what happens in this situation is emotions are tested so he has two alternative viewpoints that he can take up in case he is using this particular viewpoint to channelize his emotions in a right direction he'll take the legal part in case he chooses the illegal part it means he is violating his own emotions he is not able to keep a check of his emotions so problem solving and harnessing in the right direction is what is emotional intelligence so you have two fixed paths one is the legal path or an illegal path the right direction and the wrong direction so emotional intelligence pictures in when you are able to identify your own emotion and drive it in the right direction so in this particular scenario he had two options but if he is taking the legal path it means he is using his emotional intelligence in the right way had he chosen the naxalite movement going against this corrupt officer 
militia against the government it means he is not able to use his emotional intelligence in the right direction and he's taken the wrong route and channelized his energy in the wrong direction and the third important skill under emotional intelligence is the first two basically dealt with identifying one's own emotion and putting one's emotion in the right direction and the third skill set is also about identifying another person's emotion in the first two parameters one was able to discover the inner self the idea of mind and its emotions in the third skill what matters is it is not only important for you to identify and reflect on your own thought process but you also identify what the other person is going through so the minute you are able to see what the other person is feeling that becomes the third part of emotional intelligence so it is also about driving the narrative of this particular person identifying what he is currently going through in this particular parallel what we have to understand is three important parameters when it comes to the ethics paper so what is it one is called as sympathy the second is empathy and third is compassion when it comes to sympathy let's take an example you go to temples churches and mosques and there are people who are begging right outside the temple so you understand that they are going through certain pain you do not literally know how they feel but you can actually sense that there is some pain in their eyes so this identification of pain in someone else's eyes is what is called as sympathy so you care about their suffering so it means that you are able to reflect on the person's thought but you physically don't know what he is going through so what it basically means is you understand there is a problem but you don't know how that person is feeling is what is called as sympathy now let's look into what empathy is all about empathy means that you can actually feel what the person is currently going through let me give you an example let's say i have cleared upsc examination after fourth attempt i would not have cleared the first three attempts i would have put in a lot of energy into it and then on the fourth attempt i have cleared my examination so i have also posted as an ias officer now i see a person who is preparing for the civil service examination first attempt this person does not clear second attempt he does not clear and in this particular situation i happen to bump into him and i understand the flight of this particular person why because i have been through this process i was able to personally connect to this particular person as to how and what situation is currently going through why because i have been through it and i have experienced it so because i have experienced it i am able to relate to that particular person so empathy is when you know you feel what the other person is going through and in sympathy you just see what is happening you feel bad for them but you personally do not experience it in empathy you experience it in sympathy you do not experience the pain of another person now let's discuss about compassion as we just discussed sympathy i know that person is going through pain in empathy i am personally able to feel it and compassion is the next step of empathy where i am coming up with certain suitable measures to alleviate that person's suffering so what it basically means is i understand that person is in pain i can also feel his pain and i also provide certain amenities or basic things so that i am able to push that person off his pain let me give you an example there is a person who's not had food for several days i can see pain in his eyes so i can feel that person's pain and what i also do i take 100 rupees from my wallet and i also give him certain food so i'm elevating his suffer so this is what is called as compassion so a compassion is the next higher version of empathy so understand this it is this empathy and compassion which are also part of the third skill of emotional intelligence why because you are able to reflect on your thought in the first two skill and it is the third one where you are able to reflect on the thought process of another person and also help him so you are not only helping yourself but you are also addressing the concerns of another person through the route of empathy as well as compassion now that we have understood all of this let's take up a case study let's say you are traveling by a car in your city there is a young boy who approaches you knocks the windows of your car and pleads you to buy few pens which he is currently selling out of compassion you consider his request while you take the money out of your wallet he snatches it up and starts running a passerby who is looking at this entire scenario 
tries to help you out by catching this boy. Meanwhile, before you head to this particular place, people start hurling abuses against him and beat this young boy. So the question to you all is, what are the options available with you? What course of action will you select? So please write all your answers on the comment section and we will have an elaborate discussion of this case in the following week. Now let's look into the next article. This article is speaking about Mosaic and this stands for Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. So what is this project all about? This is basically nothing but a one year project. This will start in September 2019 and will continue up till September 2020. So this is nothing but a one year project and what will it do? It will study about the Arctic climate. So where is it housed? It is housed in Central Arctic. So what happens in this particular place? All the scientists, the number of people, the number of institutes and organizations and individuals who are all part of this project will go up to Central Arctic and they'll understand the effects of Arctic on climate change. So this project is basically understanding what impact Arctic has on the global climate. This project is designed by an international consortium. This will include all the leading polar research institutions under the umbrella of International Arctic Science Committee. What is so unique about this project? Previous studies that have been conducted in this Arctic region have been for short periods because they were not able to take up the climatic variations in this particular region. However, this particular project in total due to various phases of expedition has more than 600 people working in Central Arctic. It also means that there are about 60 institutions, about 19 countries and the logistical challenges involved, the total number of participants, the total number of participating countries the available budget represents this being the largest expedition ever in the history of Arctic. What are the components of this project? The German research icebreaker called as Polar Stone will be at the heart of the expedition. This will also be surrounded by a several kilometer wide network of monitoring stations which will be set up across this particular Arctic region. Then during this expedition, at least three research aircraft will also be deployed. And there are four icebreakers from Russia, China and Sweden, which will resupply the expedition with fuel as well as exchange personnel. Because this is a one year process and this will require fuel, energy, food supply and other requirements. It is this ship from the Russia, Sweden as well as China, which will help in addressing all these issues. So what is the significance of this project? This project will help in understanding the regional as well as the global consequences of Arctic climate change. Due to man-made causes, what we see is the ice caps are melting. And as these ice melt, there is increase in the water in the ocean. And when there is increase in the water, there could be disasters as well. And as these oceans get warmer, it influences the global weather patterns, causes changes in the monsoon patterns and also to trigger more destructive cyclones. So this project will help us understand how Arctic region can have these global repercussions and in case we are able to understand this, we would be able to take precautionary measures as well. So the idea of this project is to understand how man-made causes has created a major devastation in Arctic and how we would be able to extract information and avoid future catastrophes or disasters. This is what we need to understand with respect to this article. This article here is speaking about C40 cities climate summit. When we speak of climate changes and its consequences, we have seen in the past there are organizations, non-governmental organizations which all come up together, they step up on a common platform, a common forum and they address the issues of climate change. Then there are governments world over, India, USA, China and multiple other countries, they all come up on a common platform and they also speak about climate change. One such unique platform where important cities and its mayors come up and discuss about climate change is what is called as C40 Cities Climate Summit. So what happens? This C40 Summit is nothing but a network of world's mega cities. So you have certain mega cities across the world and these mega cities, its chief ministers or its mayors or people who have been holding office of power come up together and they address the issues of climate change. 
in this unique platform mayors or people in power from these major cities will go up onto this particular platform they also give innovative ideas with respect to india arvind kejriwal would be representing delhi so in case he happens to go there he is going to speak about the odd even formula and other steps that have been taken by the delhi government so such information from one government will be distributed across all governments so there is cross section of ideas and people from multiple cities come up and they exchange ideas so that they can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and improve climate resilience so after getting all the information to fight the issues of climate change they come back to their home cities and they also inspire the participants as well as citizens to take climate action so this c40 cities connects about 94 cities worldwide and from india it includes bengaluru chennai jaipur kolkata mumbai as well as new delhi in the present context new delhi chief minister is said to also speak about the odd and even formula and also how delhi was able to fight the menace of pollution this c40 as a unique platform was started in the year 2005 and this was started by the london mayor livingstone initially we had about 18 mega cities and this was increased to about 40 mega cities in the year 2006 and then what we currently have is about 94 cities which are coming up on to this common platform to address the issues of climate change it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about the citizenship amendment bill we have discussed about this bill couple of times we had discussed about this bill yesterday on our cnas video as well but there are two important points that this author speaks about one that this particular amendment bill stipulates that all those persons belonging to the minority communities in the countries of afghanistan bangladesh and pakistan where their minority communities namely hindus sikhs buddhist jains parsis as well as christians would not be treated as illegal immigrants in india however what this article currently says is this forgets about the minorities like the jews so the first key concern is why is that the government of india has not considered this minority community called the jews into this amendment bill this article further speaks about atheists there are people in these countries for afghanistan pakistan or bangladesh who are muslims but they are not practicing muslims which basically means they are not believing in the concept of god and they are atheists so what would happen to those people who are abused and bludgeoned in their home countries so these people will also have to be safeguarded this particular amendment bill does not take any light of this particular atheist community as well so the major issue is it is not considering the jew community and at the same time those people who do not believe in the concept of god even such people are not considered in this particular amendment the author further speaks about two types of citizenship what are those one is just solely the other one is just sanguines what is citizenship here citizenship basically is nothing but a relationship between me and individual as well as the state i perform certain actions i perform certain legal duties and i also ensure that i pay my taxes on a timely basis so what it means is i am fulfilling certain duties and the obligations that i have as an individual towards the state as a result what the state also provides is certain rights what are these rights because i am performing my duties it also provides me certain rights so what are these rights it protects me it also ensures that i have the right to vote it also helps me in identifying who i am i'll be able to contest elections from a political party i would be able to hold on to a public office so because i am performing certain legal duties it is also giving me certain rights so citizenship is a mutual respect or an obligation between me as an individual to that of a state in this citizenship there are two types what are those as we discussed it is just solely as well as just sanguinous so this just solely basically means it is birthright citizenship or it is also called as the law of the soil under this concept of just solely citizenship of an individual is determined by the place where the individual is born which means let's say for example there are couple who go to united states of america and they are the citizens of india and they give birth to a person this person 
the minute he is born on the soil of United States of America, he becomes the citizen of United States of America, which means irrespective of the citizenship or what citizenship the parents hold, the minute the baby is born in the land, in the soil of United States of America, he becomes the citizen of that particular state. So what birthright citizenship basically means is, in case there is a person who is born in that particular country, irrespective of the descent or the nationality of the parent, that person becomes the citizen of that country. So United States of America is one such example under the just solely citizenship concept. Then there is something called as just sanguinous. What happens in this particular case is a person acquires citizenship through descent that is through their parents or ancestors independent of where he is born. It means that because a person is born in that country, he does not automatically become a citizen of that country. In the state of United States of America, the minute he is born, he becomes a citizen of that country. But in just sanguinous concept, he does not become a citizen automatically. But instead, one of his parents has to be a citizen or both his parents have to be the citizens of that country. So there is something called as descent or through the parents that a baby acquires the citizenship and one such example that we currently have is with India. So India was following this concept of just solely until 2003 but after 2003 what we are following is this particular concept called as just sanguinous. So what this author says is, India as it became independent, it followed the principle of just solely. So any person born in India would be a citizen of India. With time, there have been changes with respect to the act as well. So we brought changes when it comes to the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2003, which currently says that any person, in case he has to become a citizen of India, he has to be a descent of India. So it means one or both of his parents will have to be the citizens of India. But this bill under the Citizenship Amendment Bill will be the first time that religion or ethnicity will be made as the basis of citizenship. So what is the concern the author says? India has always been inclusive irrespective of which religion they belong to. But this idea of inclusive India will be dismantled. Why? Because the bill introduces religion as one of the concepts and this could be a grave damage to the inclusive model of India is what this article all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article here is speaking about sedation and we have discussed about this topic in our day before yesterday's video and another video explaining what sedition is will also be given in our description box so kindly look into it for the entire analysis. Now let's look into the next article. This article is speaking about National E-Assessment Center. What is this? This will be an independent office and this will look into all the assessments of the income tax payers. This center will be established in the national capital region that is Delhi and this will be a part of the government's ambitious plan to launch faceless and nameless assessment for the income tax payers. The Central Board of Direct Taxes that is the CBDT which usually looks into the income tax and its policies and its framework is one which issued an order for the creation of this particular center. This center will also have about 16 officials and will be headed by a principal chief commissioner of income tax as its chief. So what is this national e-assessment center? We all pay individual income tax and this income tax is on the basis of calculation that we have with respect to our income. So for a particular particular income we will have to file income tax with the government of India. So let's say you have paid an amount tax for the government of India for that particular year. This particular amount that you have paid is not in line with the income tax department. Why? Because they sense that you have underpaid or you have not paid as per that particular limit that has been prescribed by the government of India. So there is discrepancy in calculation from what you have calculated and to what the income tax officials have been asking for. So there is a demand for more taxes. This is one situation. There is another situation where you have understated your income or you have computed excessive loss in your company or you have underpaid taxes. So in this particular moment, what happens? The income tax will ask the taxpayer to come over to the office. They'll ask them to get all the required documents on a particular date and produce evidence for their underpaying of the taxes. 
this particular component is what is also called as scrutiny assessment. So what happens in scrutiny assessment? Because you have underpaid, because you have computed excessive loss or you have understated income, you are asked to get all these evidences to support your claims on a particular date. So you'll have to go to the income tax department and give all these evidences to prove that you are legitimately right. So in this particular case, what you'll have to do, you'll have to physically go to the income tax department, see their face and also answer all their queries in order to ensure that you don't have to go physically to that particular center what the government of India has come up with is this particular program where there will be faceless transaction so it is this faceless transaction is what is called as the national e-assessment center so what happens under this program under this new system taxpayers will receive notices on their registered emails you will have to register your email you will also have to give your phone numbers the minute you have registered with an email as well as with a phone number a notification is sent via an email as well as an SMS and all the discrepancies that you have with respect to the income tax can be filed on the website with respect to this new program initiated by the government of India. So what is the significance of it? This e-assessment helps in bringing greater transparency and accountability to the scrutiny process. It reduces the bias or the corruption the tax department can enforce on you or on the part of the accessing officer so it will obviously reduce the corruption going forward in the previous instance when there was this scrutiny assessment you had to physically go to the income tax department it also means you will have to let go all your work you will have to physically make your presence there you will have to travel which means you are also investing the time on this particular travel under this particular system this will remove all that because you don't have to go physically you are avoiding the travel and you are also saving on your time as well in the previous system let's say there is an emergency situation a date has been given to you and you will have to be physically present in front of the income tax department irrespective of whether one likes it or not you may have to be there but in the present situation let's say there is an emergency situation you will have to be there with your near and dear ones so you don't have to go there physically instead you can ask one of your closed ones to also file income tax for you so what this also means is other emergencies can be addressed under this particular program and finally the setting up of this national e-assessment center is also in line with the prime minister's vision of digital india and promotion of ease of doing business so all this becomes the significant aspect of this particular center it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article now let's look into some of the prelims practice questions with reference to Ramlila, it is a performance of Ramayana epic it is performed across northern India during the festival of Dushera the staging of Ramayana is based on Ramacharita Manas which is composed by Tulsi Das it was declared by UNESCO as one of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity which of the above statements is correct the answer to this is 1, 2, 3 and 4. All the statements are correct. So kindly remember all these key facts. Why have we picked this up? Because there has been a reference that has been made with respect to Ram Leela in this particular picture. Now let's look into the next practice question. With reference to the Information Fusion Center, it has been established at the Navy's Information Management and Analytics Center in Delhi. Its vision is to strengthen maritime security in the Indian Ocean region and beyond. Which of the above statements are correct? correct the answer to this is two only why because this is not established in delhi it is established in gurugram so under this information fusion center what we will also see is this will strengthen the maritime security the entire region is benefited why because there is mutual exchange of information and this will also address the issues of piracy as well now let's look into the next practice question the archaeological site in Esur recently seen in use is in which country? The answer to this is Israel. Why have we picked this up? Because there has been a reference that has been made where Israel archaeologists on Sunday unveiled the remains of 5000 year old city at an archaeological site called as En Ensor. 
so kindly remember this particular name now let's look into the next practice question consider the following statements about river feni it is the only transboundary river between india and bangladesh it originates in the state of west bengal and then enters bangladesh which of the above statements are correct the answer to this is none why because it is not the only transboundary river there have been other as well like tista ganga so on and so forth it originates in the state of west bengal no it originates in the state of tripura so kindly remember this particular fact so moving on let's look into the next practice question with reference to agni 4 missile which of the following statements is correct it is a surface to surface missile yes it is fueled by liquid propellant only no it can deliver one ton nuclear warheads about 7500 km away no the answer to this is one only why two and three are wrong it is not the liquid propellant but two stage solid propellant and it can deliver up till 4000 km and not 7500 km now let's look into the mains practice question what is emotional intelligence explain the difference between sympathy empathy and compassion with examples another important announcement there will be no issue of the hindu on october 8 2019 as ayudha puja is a holiday for hindu and hence even we will not have any hindu analysis for tomorrow so we will not be uploading any video for tomorrow and we shall catch up on wednesday so this is it for today thank you for watching all the best